uh, Matthew chapter 23 and Matthew 16. Matthew 23, Matthew 16. And my title today is going to be, Will You Let Him? Will You Let Him? Uh, I just want to first start off, really, I'm very glad of this church, and uh, it always brings joy to my heart when I see everyone volunteering and preparing for these revivals. And I remember uh, when we first moved into this, uh, this church, it was a real blessing seeing everyone actually in here, in this room, and we're all scrubbing away, working really hard, and uh, those are the moments that really bring great joy to my heart. And the Lord does tell us that there are things that we need to do in the ministry, right? Like we should be soul winning, tithing, bringing people, to, bringing people to church and things like that, and many other things, right? And the Lord has also blessed some of us with some talents, like the playing the piano and being singing. Probably not me on the singing, but uh, he's, also, he's, also, he's, also, he's also blessed some of us with some great uh, ta- uh, skills, learned skills that we've learned, some trades, like being a contractor, uh, being a plumber, being a nanny, being a nutritionist, and you're able to help other people in the church, right? But 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 31, it says, Whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And I know we may all feel like we are doing it for the glory of God, but let's go to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23, and uh, this is the Lord speaking here, and he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, meaning more the important matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the club, the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto white sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness, even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And we notice in this passage that the Lord is condemning these Pharisees for their outward devotion, right? Their heart is the problem, and they think they're all spiritual and all that. And in the verse we read in verse 23, if you look again, uh, the Lord's basically saying that, you know, these, uh, the, the tithing that they did was actually a good thing. But the problem is, is our heart is far from doing exactly what God wants us to do, right? Uh, the weightier matters of the law. And if we read in verse 25 to 26, these Pharisees were quick to major in the minor things, right? A lot of the time we're quick to major in these things. Uh, the outside of the cup, instead of cleaning the inside first, right? And, and we need, and they were also uh, appeared righteous. They looked good on the outside, but inside they were full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And it's the heart that needs to be changed a lot of the time. It's our heart, right? And sometimes, unfortunately, we don't even know it. And the point I want to make is, remember I was saying all these good things we do for the church, a lot of the time we do these physical things, but there may be some times we use these physical things to replace, and uh, I believe that we're using these things sometimes to have a form of relationship of God. We're replacing these things. And just for example, let's say we come to the church and we clean up, we come to church, help out, we help out brothers and sisters, but you know what? When we go home, we're not taking care of the weightier matters that God wants us to do. We're not taking care of our own spiritual walk. We're not taking care of those things. And why do I know that? Because there's times where I've done that and there's times, you know, where I was in more in the flesh, right? And you know what? I'm out there trying to do something physical. It's a little spiritual, but doing something physical, passing out tracts. But God wanted me at that moment just to restore my fellowship with him, to pray, to read my Bible. And instead, I did something physical to make myself feel good, right? That's not what God wanted me to do. And don't get me, don't get me wrong, Christian. I'm not telling us to stop doing these things, right? We should do these things. Someone needs to do them. But don't use these as excuses to neglect what God wants you to do. That's what, that's what we got to do. And I believe, Christian, we can start to catch ourselves, to see some of these symptoms. It's very easy. You'll, a lot of the time we know when we're in the flesh, right? And we just got to choose, are we going to follow what God wants or follow our flesh, right? Let's go to Matthew chapter 16. 
Matthew chapter 16 is a famous verse, uh, verse 18, and this is Jesus speaking here. And he says in verse 18, And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we know here this rock is Jesus Christ, praise the Lord. It's not Peter. And, and you know, but we notice in the verse that Jesus is talking him about himself, right? And he says about himself that he will build his church. And church, that's us, right? But the problem is a lot of us are not allowing God to build us up. We're doing things our own way. And a lot of time we think the way we want to do it is exactly what we want, but it's not what God wants, right? Our, ask yourself, Christian, is exactly where you're at in your life, is it exactly where God wants you? Right? Maybe it's your career in your life. Maybe you put your the uh, put your uh, wife and your uh, the put your the ministry over your wife or your or your family, which that's not actually what God wants, right? Or maybe you're more in the flesh or you're very carnal, right? I don't know what it is, but you know between you and God, right? And uh, just like I was saying earlier, you know we got to do what God wants. And we, we can tell when we are in the, the flesh, right? But the Galatians chapter 5, verses 17, it says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. And Brother Randall's been telling us we can't be both, right? You can't be spiritual when you're in the flesh. And the verse also says, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. And we cannot do the things that God wants us to do when we're doing things our own way. You need to be in the Spirit. You need to follow what God wants you to do, Christian. And we need to be careful because when we focus on these minor things, right, and never take care of our own spiritual walk, then one day we may unfortunately go through a, a big trial in our life and you know what, we end up falling away. We end up falling away because we weren't grounded on what God wanted us to do. We weren't grounded in his word and we weren't allowing Jesus to build us up. We weren't allowing him. And Ephesians chapter 5 verses 18 it says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And Paul is telling us, don't be drunk with wine wherein it's so excess, but you need to be filled with that spirit, amen? And uh, don't some of us, like, uh, like Brother Mike Fernandez or these preachers that come to our church and these pastors, the evangelists, the missionaries, you literally feel like the, the spirit just flowing out of them, right? Like that, that verse goes where like, uh, the, out, of, out of his belly shall flow uh, rivers of living water, right? We, re we literally need to try to also aim to be like that, is, amen? We, everywhere we go, we should have that spirit just literally flowing out of us. And that's how it should be, Christian. And we need to let God build us up. And it's not all about helping out the church and passing tracts and all that. We need to have that balance, Christian. We need to have that balance. Don't be like a good Catholic thinking you're doing all these good things. Don't, you're doing all these good things for your own feeling good moment, right? We can't be doing those things. And Christian, the, the most important thing is we need to have a real relationship with God. You've got to make it personal to you. You got to, that, what was that verse? That ye may know him, right? We want to really know him. And this church is so important to me. This local church really is. And I don't want this church to fall. And I'm pretty sure a lot of you do too. But when we're not grounded and we're not doing our own part on our own time, that can happen, right? We can cause problems even in the church. We can, we can, make, uh, we can put burdens on our pastor and end up this ministry can fall, right? And just like Paul Ianello said, right, on his last revival, he said that, you know, the devil has his sights on this church. We're, you guys have no idea how much fruit we're, uh, this ministry is doing for these people. Imagine if this ministry fell, how many people, how many hundreds of thousands of people are looking up to us on this ministry, right? If, if imagine like we did something, we were part of it, right? How discouraging would it be for those people, those hundreds of thousands of people? How discouraging would it be? And not only that, we're, dis uh, we're letting down the Lord, right? We're letting down the Lord, right? And uh, just, like, uh, just like Brother Mike Fernandez does, which is scary, you know, will you, make the re will you make God, you know, your priority in your life? Will you be revived through this? Uh, will you make Jesus Christ be the center of your life? Will you start letting him build you up this weekend? And I'll close here for uh, these last three verses. It says Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 4. It says, He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. 
Just and right is he. Psalms 18.2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation, my high tower. Psalms 31.3, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Church, will you let the Lord lead you and guide you, just like the title of my sermon? Will you let him lead you and guide you? Let's see. Uh, go ahead and open up to uh, Philippians chapter 4. Amen. Philippians yeah. chapter 4. Um, there's a whole bunch of fleshy things, a whole bunch of bad, horrible things that the Lord actually wants you to give him. Now, you might be going, that sounds a little heretical. That sounds a little weird. But, but just give me a moment and, and we'll look at a couple of verses here. Um, The title of my sermon is Some Fleshy Things That the Lord Wants You to Give Him. Let's pray. Uh, God, my Father, I just thank you, Lord, for for gathering us together. Father, thank you, Lord, that uh, you're so good to us and and you care about us and you love us. Uh, No matter matter what state we're in, Lord, uh, whether we're... Whether we're lost or saved, Lord, you love us all, Father. And I pray, Lord, if anyone here is, is lost or anyone listening online is lost, Lord, that they would get saved and today would be the day of their salvation, Lord. And you keep this good spirit in this revival and you just uh, have us to make some changes, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. So uh, amen. Philippians, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Jesus doesn't want you to be full of care and worry. Uh, if you're full of care and worry, do you think that that would really please him? No, because he says be careful for nothing. And so Jesus doesn't want you to be full of care and worry. Instead, what he wants you to do if you're in that position is tell him. Tell him that you're full of care and worry. Tell him that you're overwhelmed by the cares and worries of the world. Because let's be honest, some people are overwhelmed with what they're facing. Some people are really worried about about the situation that they're in. Perhaps they don't have a job. Perhaps a lot of their family members are sick and, and they're going through a lot. And there are Christians who are, who are dealing with a lot, who are, who are feeling like it's too much, it's too much of a burden. And what the Lord wants you to do is He wants you to tell Him. He wants you to give that over to Him. Um, and all, all that you're stressed out about, that you have no idea what to do, just tell it to the Lord through prayer and supplication. Just tell it to Him. And he'll, He's going to do something amazing. He's going to give you a peace that passeth all understanding. A peace that passes all understanding. When you really pour out your heart to God through prayer, God gives you peace, true peace that can only come from Him. And it's one of the most beautiful things ever in a, in a person's life. It's, it's so sweet and so good. The lost world has no idea what you're experiencing. When the entire world is afraid of World War III and, and you know, all, all kinds of garbage going on and you're just... You're just going through your life peaceful, not, not, nothing's bothering you. You can't even really explain it to yourself. You're just like, it's, it's God. That's the only explanation is God. The peace that passes all understanding. The lost world doesn't know it, and only you can say it's God. That's it. That's it. So only God can give you that comfort in troubling times. And there's no other description for it. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Jesus Christ loves you so much that He says, Give me all your cares. Just give, them all, give, give me all your cares. He said, what, what are you doing carrying those around? What are you doing? Just give them to me. There's not a single friend on the face of the earth that says, give me all your worries, your concerns, your, 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 your burdens, your trials. There's not a single person, there's not a single friend that can do anything for that. Only the Lord Jesus Christ. Only the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so, He can give you peace. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that, are, that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Heavy laden is heavy burdens. And so Jesus is telling you that he's going to give you rest. But you first have to come to him. 
The, the, he's, just, he's just waiting with arms wide open. The rest is right there. And he says, just come. Just come. That's all you got to do. But you first have to do it, right? You can't, you can't, you can't uh, just keep on doing what you're doing and expect anything to be different, right? What the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, right? And so, <laughs> yes. Uh, so man can't take those heavy burdens off of you, right? Only God can. Only Jesus Christ can. Go ahead and turn over to 2 Timothy chapter uh, 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. Now, it's, it's real easy to say, oh yeah, I'm not fearful. You know, people try to give off the image that really nothing's bothering them. When in reality, sometimes there are things that are bothering them when they are full of fear and, and they have a spirit of fear. And one thing that can hinder you in your race is fear. In the beginning, maybe when you first got saved, you, you were afraid of so many things. You were afraid of, of what your friends thought, what your family thought, uh, your work, you know, the, the life that you are now going to live. All kinds of things maybe that the devil is throwing at you. And you spent all that time fearing so many different scenarios and situations that never even happened. They never happened and, and you wasted all that time. And so if you're afraid, cast that fear upon Jesus. You know, uh, it's, it's real easy to think that just because you're doing well in your walk that you think everybody else is doing well in their walk. It's real easy to think that just because you're close with the Lord and you don't have any fear that everybody else in your church doesn't have any fear. All, all, all the Christians that you know don't have any fear. There's a lot of Christians who are afraid of a lot of things going on. There are a lot of saved people who are afraid of, of all kinds of things. And so if you have a spirit of fear, tell it to the Lord. Tell it to the Lord. Like 1 Peter 5, 7, 7 said, right? Cast it onto him. Cast him upon him. And God does not give you a spirit of fear. So if he doesn't, then who does? If God is not the author of confusion, who is? It's the devil. It's the devil. The devil would love to see as many Christians afraid and just live in a constant state of fear of what man can do to them. But as Christians, the only thing we should fear is the Lord. Turn over to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 10, verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. This is... This is what we should be afraid of. Who has the power to cast the soul and body in hell? And that's, that's the Lord. Yeah. Nations can fight against nations. Uh, people can commit horrible acts of violence against one another. All kinds of problems can arise up in the world. But guess what? The only thing that anybody should ever fear is the Lord. Yeah. That's the only thing we should fear. It's not, it's not fear like that stupid FDR quote, right? You know, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that just because, oh, you don't have any fear, so go stand out in the middle of the street and, you know, wait till a car comes at you. No, that's stupid. You're supposed to be wise. You're supposed to be wise, right? It, and I'm not saying that, oh, just go do something and get arrested because you don't have fear of the, you know, what the world can do to you. And I mean, listen, the fear that we should have is is biblical, right? The fear that we should have is, is what matches with the Word of God. It, it shouldn't be things that are not biblical. If we are afraid of what someone might say to us when we hand them a free chick track, the problem's not them, it's us. The problem's not them. If, if, if we're afraid of what someone might say when we go out there street preaching, the problem's not them. It's us. It's us. We should trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord to do all things for him. And so whatever that person says or does to you, well, guess what? It's exactly what the Lord wants to happen to you because you're trusting in him. If you're trusting in him and things happen to you, you're in the will of God. 
You're in the will of God. What's there to fear? So if that person gets a little upset, yells at you and rips up that track, you did something to please the Lord. You did something to please God. That's all that matters. Um, there's a whole lot of, uh, of other traits that I won't mention, but there's a whole lot of other things that the Lord wants you to give him. For example, some old man stuff. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31 tells you to put away your fleshy bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking. How can we even have the ability to put off those ugly traits from our old man? It's by giving them to the Lord, by giving them to him. You can't put away those things if you don't first give them to God. Through prayer, ask Jesus Christ to take away those things and fill us with more of the Holy Spirit. Why, why would the Lord want you to uh, recognize those bad traits and ask Him to take, take those away from you? It's because that Ephesians 4.32 says, so you can be kind one to another, <laughs> tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's why he asks you to give him those old fleshy old man traits because so that you can start being kind one to another. One of the, one of the greatest traits that any Christian could ever have anybody is being forgiving. I mean, if you're a forgiving person, you truly show God's love. Amen. When you're able to forgive someone because the Lord's forgiven you of so much, right? The Lord, the Lord was able to, to, to see you not for, not for who you are, but for who you could be, right? The Lord, the Lord saw you for, for, uh, as an adopted child of Him that you could be that one day. And so He forgave you of everything. So the devil wants to rob Christians of their ability to forgive one another. So that bitterness builds up, that wrath builds up. But don't let that happen to you, Christian. No. And the most important fleshy thing that you could ever give the Lord is your sins. Go over to Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 9, and we'll look at verse, uh, verse 17. And refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy works that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art a God ready to yes. pardon, Amen. gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. God is waiting. He's ready to pardon the sins of the entire world. But they just refuse it, right? He's just waiting with open arms. He's yeah. telling them, give me your sins. Yes. Yeah. 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The moment that you admitted you were a sinner, you couldn't save yourself, and you asked the Lord to wash away your sins, <laughs> you gave him your sins. Woo! You just gave them to him. He said, he said, here, give me your sins. I can take it. I can take it. I can take it. Give it to me. That's the greatest transaction in the history of mankind. God took away your sins as far as the east is from the west. And when you stand before him one day, he's going to see a holy, blameless, spotless child. Because 1 John 1, 7 says, The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us away from all sin. All sin. That blood that was shed on Calvary already washed your sins, past, present, and future. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He took away the filth of sin from your life. He cleansed you and gave you a mansion up in heaven, and it's waiting with your name on the front door. It's, it's right up there on, on, you know, Glory Avenue and Mercy Lane, you know, whatever. I don't know. What kind of man, what kind of God says, give me your sins? No, no other religion, atheist, nobody, nobody has that. The Lord says, give me your sins. I'll take them. With our arms open wide, he says, give them to me. And he did it. He did it to show true love. Praise the Lord so we don't have to go to hell. Amen. Uh, let me just go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for this opportunity, not just for me, but all the other preachers. Lord, thank you for bringing uh, uh, Brother Mike Fernandez here, oh Lord God, with Brother George as well, Father. Thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for us and will do, Lord God. I pray you'd use all of these messages. Lord God, fill me, and, and uh, with the power of your Holy Spirit, put me behind you, Lord. I pray you'd speak to all of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Let me get there. 
John chapter 8, verse 1. All right, bring the fire. It's getting... Sorry, sorry, Brent. Mess up your piano. Amen. John chapter 8, verse 1, and it says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Verse 5, Now Moses in the law commanded us that thou should, uh, thou, that, that, excuse me, that such, such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Right? Okay, so what's going on here is that uh, this woman is caught in adultery. Literally, she's taken out of, out of the action and thrown in the midst and right in front of Jesus' face. Now I want to ask you right now, too often, our initial reaction, when we hear certain messages that may not pertain to you, but every single other person, your, what is your initial reaction? What is your initial reaction? It's, oh man, I, I'm glad this person's here. They need to be hearing this right now. But let me ask you this. Let me, let me ask you, look, at, look in the verses. Where was the man, first of all? Where was he? He was probably in the very crowd condemning the woman. So where are you? When you're hearing a message that may not be about you, where are you? I mean, you look at, especially married women, or I mean, married people, married people. I'll say, okay, men do it too. I mean, especially Cindy and I, we look at each other like, mm-hmm, you better listen up. But, but one thing is that you are so quick con- to, to condemn the other person. And tell them, you should have listened to me. You should have listened. Didn't I tell you? You know what all that really means in your heart? The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. All you're really saying is, I forgot what God did for me. That's what you're really saying right there. But guess what? God didn't forget. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. It says, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up his, uh, himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a, first stone, uh, cast a stone at her. You know what? He didn't forget. He didn't forget who they were when they forgot themselves. Wow, right? I mean, why did they say it in the first place? It says in verse 6, This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. You know, why are you saying that in your mind or in your heart towards other people? You're tempting that person. You know, every single time that you say, oh, You should have listened to me. I told you so. You know what you're actually doing? What you're actually doing is that you're tempting the person and you're, you're putting unnecessary pressure on them to confess their sins to you instead of confessing their sins to Jesus Christ. You're actually, you're basically tempting Jesus Christ. You're saying, Lord, I got this. I got this. I, I have a black tie and shoes on and you know, I, I'm doing things right. I got this, God. You're tempting him. You know what? But here, what we're going to learn about uh, Jesus Christ here, the, uh, the, me- the title of my message today is that the work of the voice, uh, the work of his voice. And you, what you'll come to find out here in John 8 is that Jesus Christ doesn't pay attention to the accusers. He pays attention to the accused. He pays attention to the ones that are, are accused. My first point was is that the word invokes. In other words, he addresses the situation. Look at the first thing that he did. Look at verse 6. It says, This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus looked to that person and said, Don't worry, I'll take care of it. No, he said, It says, But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Jesus Christ does not hear the accusers. He does not hear you when you say, I, I, I told them. Oh man, I, I knew this would happen. He is not listening to you. You know, you're, you're talking to yourself instead of God. That's, that's the wrong place to be. You're far from God when you're saying that. You better watch out. You want God to hear you, you better stop doing that in the first place. You better stop saying that. Look at the verse 8. My second point is that the, the word wrote. Verse 8, it says, and again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Now, look at, look at the wording over here. It says, 
that he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Jesus stooped down and wrote, the word comes down to the depths of your heart, and he writes on the good ground of your heart. Or maybe it's not good ground. I mean, we just started this little revival. But the truth of the matter is, is that we're going to leave here even today. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna sin right after. We're going to go back to where we tried to get away from. You know why? Because maybe our heart isn't so good. Go to Mark chapter 4 really quick. Mark chapter 4. Right, the parable of the sower and the seed, that's, that's, it's talking about the heart problems. Because what Jesus Christ does is that he comes down from heaven and comes down to the dust of where you are. And he writes on, the, on your heart with his word. That's good, brother. Come on. The word writes his word on your heart. For faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Mark chapter 4 verse 18. Is this you? And Jesus... Oh, it ain't it. No, I'm in Matthew. That's why. All right. Mark chapter 4 verse 8. I got three minutes left. Okay. Just kidding. Mark chapter 4 verse 8. Sorry if I go over, Pastor. Um, and it says... 18, excuse me. And it says, And these are they which are sown among thorns, and such as hear the word. You're hearing the word of God right now. You know the Spirit is talking to you right now. But what are you going to do about it? Verse 8, 19. And the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. I looked up the word choke. I mean, you think of like a chokehold, you know what I mean? But that's not what it means. Um, in, uh, in, you know, in, in regarding plants, you know, choke actually means preventing from growing by depriving it of light, air, or nourishment. You understand those, that, 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 that light, air, nourishment? Those are the three things that God gives you through his word. Yeah. Yeah. And guess what? Your heart is choking those things that are stopping you from growing. It's stopping it, and Amen. no one else is stopping it but yourself. Amen. And guess what? You know what's going to happen? You're going to still wonder why you're not growing. That's and you're still going to wonder why you can't seem to wow. understand more. That's it. And it's not just understanding the Word of God. You're going to still lack understanding other people's perspective. Mm, you still wonder why, because you're choking the Word. Preach, preach. Now, here's, here's a couple tips. I looked up uh, how to make good soil, right? Because you can't... You can't uh, plants can't flourish without good ground first, right? So I'm going to give you some five things, right? The first thing is that the first thing you got to do is you got to test the soil. The Bible says, search me, O God, and know my heart. You got to examine yourselves. The second thing is you got to check its moisture, hmm, kind of like the, the living water. Hmm. Are you filled? The third thing is you got to clear out all and any weeds, kind of like some tares that were sown by who? The devil, Right? The fourth thing is you got to till the soil. In other words, you got to break it. You know why? Because there's too much hardness in your heart. And the last thing is you have to rake it and water it thoroughly. In other words, you got to sanctify yourself. And you got to clear it up. And you got to invite the Holy Spirit in. Amen. Jeremiah 4 3 says, Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. The last thing the Word did is that he smote as well. Go back to John chapter 8. You know, I really fear that, I mean, we'd all like to say that, you know, our heart is good ground, but I fear that, especially since we're growing, a lot of us, where we're at right now, is we're, we're, we're in the thorns right now. We're in the thicket. And you got to break it. you got to break it. Because you're getting some good preaching here tonight. Amen. And you guys, we're, we're in a good church right now. Amen. But what is a good church if your heart isn't right for it? The last thing is that the word smote. Look at verse 9 and it says, And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Now, although the Jews were the ones to cast that stone, in reality, the one to strike the heart was Jesus Christ himself. That's right. And it's evident because what happens is that they all left. Yeah. They all scattered from the word. They all left, except that one. Except that one. Verse 9, you'll see that they, they, they just left. 
But here, this is what I really want you to look at. Look at verse 10. And he says, and it says, When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said to her, Women, where, where are those thine accusers? Hath, not, hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Amen. You know what the word does? It gets you alone with him. It gets you alone. Go to Psalms chapter 8. And I'll close it here. Amen. Why is it important to get alone with God? Psalms chapter 8. This broke my heart when I read this verse. You know why it's important to get alone with God? Because only then you'll consider. Amen. Amen. Psalm chapter 8, verse uh, 3. <clears throat> and it says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, Amen, <clears throat> which, th which thou hast ordained, what, what is man? That thou art mindful of him, and the Son of Man, that thou visitest him. You got to get alone with God. You got to get alone with God. And you got to let the Word of God work in your hearts. Because only then will you really consider and you'll... Only then will God be glorified. Amen? Amen. That's all I got. Amen. 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 All right, okay. Leviticus chapter 21. Leviticus chapter 21. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, going to change the pace a little bit here. And I heard uh, Jack Woods one time give an invitation to quit the ministry. Oh, he did. And so, I thought I'd, I'd give you a little something here from Leviticus chapter number 21. And in Leviticus 20, 21 are some qualifications for the priesthood. priesthood. Chapter 21, look at verse number 16. Verse 16. And Leviticus 21 and verse number 16. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, and saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the head of bread of his God. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man, or a lame, or he that hath a flat nose, or anything superfluous, or a man that is broken footed, or broken handed, or broke or crook back, or dwarf, or have a blemish in the eye, scurvy, scabbed, or stones broken. Now, some of you probably want me to start at the last one, but I don't know if we'll get there. But uh, it is a very spiritual thing here. Okay, now, uh, uh, the first thing, and the Lord showed us the very first thing that disqualifies you from the ministry is being blind. In Grass Valley is a mine called the Empire Mine. It goes 11,000 feet down into ground on an angle. And years ago when they first started mining the gold out of there, uh, they used horses to start with, but the uh, corral is a seven-foot ceiling. It's down about 100 feet in the ground. One little lamp, a little light at night. And the horse would hit his head on the uh, low ceiling and go crazy. So they got mules and the mule hit his head one time and that's it. Some of you need to take a lesson. Once you get your head hit one time, stop what's causing the pain. All right. But, you know, those, those mules, they took them down there and they'd leave them at night because it was a daytime job. Of course, it was night all the time down in the mine, but uh, they left them at night and they'd put the one little light, a candle in there for the light of, for the mules as they stayed until they stayed the next morning for their work. After a while, after uh, I don't even know for sure exactly how long, but those mules would go blind because they had no light. They had to be led, led around to the job, and uh, if they took them to the top, after a while, the bright light they couldn't stand. So the first disqualification of any minister is stay 
in the light because if you get in the dark and don't get any light, after a while you can't stand the light and you won't be any good for anybody. The second thing, and this, hey, I, this is what the Lord said. The second thing is lame. I, you got to keep moving. You got to move forward. I mean, Mephibosheth was lame in both feet, and Saiba, he led him to David and almost got a, you know, a bad mark on Mephibosheth because you're lame and you can't move forward and you're not leading the people. They're not going anywhere. And the third thing, I mean, is the flat nose. Anybody here got a flat nose? If they, if they do, if they do, I'll skip it. Ah, uh, uh, see, uh, 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 the lame, the lame can't keep up the pace. There's quite a pace in the ministry. You know that? I mean, things have to keep moving. You got to keep up with it. And uh, if you're not able to go to be in the right place at the right time, somebody might mess you up. Or, I mean, Ahab let Ben Hadad live, and. Uh, uh, the Lord sent a prophet to face him off and the prophet was the mouth of God and uh, uh, he was to obey for the purpose of God and uh, he wouldn't do it so God found another man. Uh, don't be a lame sissy. Keep going. I mean, I, I, you know, if somebody smites you, you just go anyway. And the third thing is, he that hath a flat nose, I kind of jumped ahead of myself and backed up a little bit. It was, you know what, if you've got a flat nose, you can't smell the roses. You can't smell the roses. Hey, I mean, they can't, it's not, the worst part is every once in a while a rat gets in the congregation and if you can't smell the rat, you're going to be in trouble. You, you can't have a flat nose. Uh, 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 if the Lord is stirring a soul in your church to get excited about God, don't cause a stink. All right, amen, don't cause a stink. <laughs> amen. And uh, I'm going fast here because I want to get through and I want you to... <laughs> amen. Uh, uh, the fourth thing here is anything superfluous. Now, I'm going to get a little bit personal and I'm going to uh, pick on a... Uh, the evangelist, and I'm not going to tell you who he is. <laughs> but I went to a tent meeting, and uh, uh, it was two preachers. A younger preacher was first, of course, and the older preacher was last. And the older preacher, he didn't come to hear the first preacher, the young preacher. They have this timing system. And he walks in of just about the time he's given the closing points on his message and walks in there and sits on the front row and he goes, Hallelujah. And then the preacher gets up there. And this super, you know what superfluous is? It's something you, that is not necessary. There's more than you need, all right? And so he gets up there and he gets to preaching and he's, he's got a, you know, a, you, you watch this, the skaters in the Olympics and they chronograph those things, right? They practice, you know. They get the moves all down. And the guy comes out there, you know, and he's, he's stepping like this. My wife says, my wife says, is there something wrong with him? I said, yeah, he's putting on a show. He's strutting his stuff. He's superfluous. And the Bible says he's not fit for the ministry. But they wouldn't go along with me. Uh, uh, they wouldn't. I, broken footed. I mean, how good would a man be on a football field if he's going to kick and kick an extra point or a field goal for the win in the last winning seconds if he's broken footed? Uh, if he can't kick, I mean, if the thing's broken uh, and the hands all messed up. We had a guy in our church that had two or three fingers on one hand and one finger gone on the other, and I never saw anything that man couldn't do. He figured out a way to hold a hammer, but he didn't have his index finger. All right, he would work. He would get it done. And when you gave him the job, you could go, you know, go fishing. When you come back, the job is going to be done. We had another man in the church named Mike Hainline. I say his name because you don't know him. He's gone. Uh, I believe he was saved. And, and he went, and he had one finger missing. And he said, uh, I just can't work. And not only that, 
He quit coming to church, and I said, why aren't you coming to church for us, uh, anymore for He says, well, uh, God and I made a deal. If he'd leave me alone, I'd leave him alone. <laughs> and about six months later, he died of a heart attack, and God left him alone, I guess, long enough to do that. But you, uh, uh, next, look at the next one here in verse number 20. Look in verse 20 what it says. In verse 20, or a crook back, or a dwarf. You ever heard of the story of the guy was running along the road and... Uh, uh, and uh, he hit a, a car driving on the road going a little bit too fast and he pulled over and the other car pulled over and the other car pulled over and there was a little dwarf guy in there. <laughs> Never mind, I better not tell that one. Okay, here we go. You know, the man can't straighten up. He'll never look up. He'll never see anything up in glory. He'll never show you any glory at all, folks. He never grows up. Buddy Cargill said most young men, they live to be 35 years old before they grow up. I believe that. And uh, uh, they lose their minds at 13 and they go dead. I mean, absolutely dead. But uh, the dwarf could have a chip on his shoulder because he's a dwarf. Right? Uh, not everybody is tall, dark, and handsome like some of you guys. All right, but uh, if God will take one of his best soldiers, one of the best soldiers he's ever had for the Lord Jesus Christ and for the cross uh, at a young age. I mean, there was a guy named Lanny Hasbrook, one of the best preachers I ever heard. God took him at 58 years old. Uh, Spurgeon died at 58 years old. And uh, if he'll take one of his best soldiers of the cross, then it's possible he's decided to use uh, an infirm for his glory. I'm not saying that these can't do it. This is Old Testament. I understand that. But there are some things you don't want to do. I mean, if somebody can't come into church and he can't shout and he can't be happy in the Lord and he can't have joy of the Lord and he wants, I mean, if he's all serious all the time and he doesn't have any fun or any jokes or anything else, uh, could be their congregation that turned out that way. Because most congregations really turn out like their pastor is. I mean, really and truly. I hope you don't speak, all of you don't start speaking in Korean. And then I, if you do, I know you're like your pastor. Yeah, amen. Uh, I was telling them, I, I, I'm, I'm getting through real quick, but I went to a restaurant in Reno the, yesterday, and on the menu was kimchi. i never seen that. That's in Reno, Nevada. Yeah, kimchi. Uh, and look at the last one here. Uh, verse... Uh, uh, well, I didn't the last one quiet. I don't know if I can. I better hurry. Uh, <laughs> The scurvy or the scabbed. You know what scurvy is a condition of? The lack of sun. There's a guy down in Southern California. He sent several students to PBI. After a few years, he got you know, upset with the ministry, and he quit and got him a motorcycle and a used car salesman job. And uh, after a while, he came back to that same church after he had left it and talked to the pastor that was there. And he said, the whole time that I pastored, I never read my Bible. And you get scurvy because you're not exposed to the sun. The only way you're going to get exposed to the sun is in this book. That's the only way. The sun was not shining in his life and it killed him off and now he's a used car salesman riding a motorcycle and doing nothing for God. You know what a, cry, a scab is? A scab uh, uh, that it is not worth the cost it got you, uh, you had to pay to get the scab. Yeah, a lot of those running around. Now there's the last one, the stone's broken. Look with me in 2 Chronicles. I believe it's 2 Chronicles. It may be the first. Uh, first Chronicles. Okay, look in 1 Chronicles. And I don't know if you know anything about horses or mules. And of course, the mule learns real fast, as I showed you. The horse, to get a horse that most people can handle if he's a stallion, they have to geld him. Uh, and geld him, calm, when you geld a horse, it calms them down. But there are some other problems with gelding a horse. Look in 1 Samuel chapter number 26 and look with me in verse number, 
I'm not sure I got that. Um, I'm looking for in chapter 26. I did not mark the verses down, and I don't have them marked in here. Uh, it's talking about the porters of the temple, those that were watch over uh, the things of the temple. Every church has to have somebody that watches over the church. Uh, Brother Greg, Greg Reinhardt had a deacon one time that anytime there was any friction between one of the members and the pastor, uh, the deacon, I mean, this is a real deacon, he would go to those people, pray with them, find out what the problem was and try to straighten it out and help them to realize that whatever it is is most likely not of any consequence anyway and get the thing patched up. In chapter 26 of 1 Chronicles, there's two verses here that it says that the porters there must be strong men. Alright, uh, 2 Chronicles 26, no wonder you didn't find it. Alright, just don't pay attention to me. 2 Chronicles 26, I think it's about verse 6 or 8 is one of them. Uh, if you find it, say it good, loud, and clear where I can get it. Here, okay, verse. I think it's First Chronicles twenty-six eight. First Chronicles. Yeah, verse eight. All these. That's what I want right there. First Chronicles twenty-six eight. All right, the porters of the temple were to be strong men. If you gelled a horse, he will never be as strong as he was when he is a stallion. He will not endure his law. And uh, he, he, look, look, a stallion is hard to control. You have to take his spirit and somehow control the spirit, break it without losing the spirit. But if you geld him, he will never be as strong as he was. That's why you find uh, uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of women want to buy stallions that they end up, they can't handle because <laughs> he's a stallion. I know I had one. I, I know what it's all about. But for stamina and work, you've got to have a stallion. I read a thing the other day, and I don't remember who said this, and I told uh, Brother Brett and Brother Max about it, uh, Malcolm X, and I, uh, I said, today's young men are about the third of the man that their grandfather was. You need strong men. You don't need to break the... the yeah, but, yeah, you know what I mean, don't you? <laughs> Amen. All right, that's just quick. That's a little bit of something to help you. All right. <laughs>